I want you to imagine something. Imagine that you're asked about what role the games we experience play in people's lives. How would you even begin to answer a question like that? Personally, being a firm believer in the approach of narratology, I could emphasize what a medium that has access to this unique blend of characteristics can do for us narratively. After all, plenty of experiences across the industry can attest to that, and ambitious studios, regardless of whether they're AAA or indie, continuously seek to push the medium to achieve its full potential. If it's used to its greatest effect, a game can be an experience that touches the hearts of players from all backgrounds, often in very personal and emotional ways. But to me, that question has another answer that's just as intriguing as the one that highlights the ability of storytelling in this space. And it has to do with the mechanism by which games leave their impact on us. So I'm going to lay out a crazy scenario that I think will apply to you as much as it does me. You and I and everyone else, we've all, at one point or another, felt the need to lighten the burdens that life can put on us. And there's various ways to do that. But if you're attuned to this medium, sometimes we've turned to a game as our avenue of escape. We've temporarily replaced the weight of our own personal struggle with immersive dives into settings brimming with the vibrancy of the fantastical, abandoned reality for contexts that speak of worlds independent from the one we know. We sit down to play something and feel our awareness of reality simply fade into the distance, in a way almost descending into the blissful embrace of a gentle dream. Whether it manifests as pleasant decompression or a reprieve from stress, that effect is present for everyone who engages with the medium. But when the time comes to step out of these virtual wonderlands, realism stands ready, in all of its unembellished clarity, to welcome us back to the complications of our lives. And it's within that space, that dissonance between immersion and detachment, that a little RPG called Amori released last year, and brought that feeling into the forefront for me, taking advantage of what a game could be, to weave together a narrative that reconciles both of those concepts into a single unified experience, one that's able to use that contrast, to take advantage of it, as the method by which it characterizes the conflict at its core. One of the best things a video game can do for me is to pull me into the magic of its context, completely and truly. I remember when I was a kid, I played the enigma that was Xenogears, a game that I probably shouldn't have had access to at that age, and just paused at the magic that was the moment where Faraway Promise played in Seaton's house. I had no idea what was coming, or even what the song meant at the time, but that melody, there was something about it that captured me made me feel like nothing but this room and this music box existed. Until, of course, I reached my daily allowance of playtime and had to step away from the wonders of Faye's world, back into what felt like the mundanity of my own. But while that's just a child's perspective, that general idea still resonates with me. Escapism is everywhere in games. It's practically unavoidable. We turn to them when we're having bad days, when we've been exhausted by the minutiae of life, or when we just want to forget. It's no surprise that we value complete immersion as highly as we do. These experiences are really good at that, and there's a particular relationship Amori has with that idea that I haven't been able to stop thinking about in the eight months that have passed since I finished it. There's a certain perceptiveness there, you could say. It's aware of how that aspect of the medium flows with us, and transforms the process into a cornerstone of its identity. When I stepped into the game for the first time, one of the things I was greeted with was this phrase, Welcome to White Space. You've been living here for as long as you can remember. At the time, I didn't think much of it. 
other than as a message meant to establish where Sunny, the protagonist, was. But when I look back on it now, it's a phrase that echoes throughout the entire game, and something you can interpret through multiple lenses. Just a little further, past the total emptiness that surrounded me, the game began to establish this surreal, absurd realm of reverie. And this place, this unreal setting, was characterized as a realm of pure, imaginative spectacle. There were weird little eccentric creatures that couldn't possibly exist in our world, fantastical varied environments, and even a whimsical, fun little adventure. As it so often happens, I felt the clear vision of my grounded awareness gradually begin to give way to the hazy bliss of the game's illusion. It felt like a dream, which makes sense, because that's exactly what it was. All the things that I saw in those early few hours, that entire context itself, it's all taking place in Sunny's head. And even though I wouldn't know it until much later, that was the first sign of how it communicates with the player. How the game is truly able to leave its mark on anyone who lets themselves become immersed within the wonders of its narrative. I, in unison with Sunny, experienced his dreams through the eyes of his headspace identity, Omori. And we were always surrounded by the distinctive features of that context. Characteristics that would be standard, completely unremarkable when placed alongside other games, but with how they're framed here, would shatter my preconceived notions, and play a significant, often even unsettling, role in its narrative. Immersed within his mind, Amori is accompanied by what are essentially caricatures of his friends in the real world, along with his sister, who's shown to be the linchpin that ties them all together. The tone and atmosphere taken with them fits their high-spirited charm, and the innocent leisure of their youth. However, by a similar measure, I also wondered if their characterization was nothing but a superficial joy that lacked ambiguity. Something that would be inoffensive to any player, but also that world's creator. As you go on into the narrative, the game leads you into intimate familiarity with a system that's unique to it. In Amori, the emotions of characters is a fundamental aspect of how gameplay flows, from narrative beats to internal challenges. Even the combat itself is built around feelings, where all participants, from allies to adversaries, operate off of a common trifecta of emotional states. And that's all well and good, but there's an aspect of the system you might take notice of that the game doesn't outright tell you. That apparent simplicity of the Headspace cast is at the forefront even here. Each part of the emotion triangle has three intensities, and the highest stages are only accessible through... Omori. While his friends can all reach the second stage of every emotion, they're never shown to have access to the three highest stages. When a friend told me that, as I was thinking about what strategies I would use with the system, I wondered about the purpose behind that detail. Was it meant to imply that Omori was the most emotionally dynamic out of all of them? Did the other characters just have a negligible amount of depth to them? Those weren't the only thoughts I had relative to all of this, though. I knew that, by themselves, all of these facets of the dream could be interpreted as entirely natural. The general atmosphere of the game was something I could see as just the way the game's tone is. The cast might have just been behaving as the children that they were, and the mechanics of Amori's emotional states could have just been given increased depth due to him being the protagonist. At the end of the day, what I was looking at was something that seemed like a fun system. Of course, it clearly had something hidden under the surface. I was under no pretenses about that. But as for the game itself, I was roaming around the world with Amori and his friends, meeting crazy characters, KOing anything in my way with these upbeat charming little themes, and this interesting battle system, on a dreamlike adventure, without any high stakes or serious qu <laughs> And then, I woke up. Or, more specifically, Sunny 
woke up into a wholly new context, his real life. And what I found was a setting that completely juxtaposed my understanding of what the game had shown as its establishing factors. I saw an interlinking of fantasy and reality, and something that redefined what their purpose was in the wider context of the experience. When I think of how exactly escapism as a concept affects our lives, I think of all the afternoons I've spent playing whatever game I'm fixated on, or reading book after book that's helped me escape whatever's going on in my life, at least for a little while. Magical space platformers, living continents on a sea of clouds, and Eastern Roman history novels couldn't have felt further away from the things that were keeping me up at night. But at the end of the day, I still had to shut off the console close the book, file it all away, and face the real world head on, no matter what it had in store for me. And the way the game frames Sunny's life in that light is striking. What you're shown is a lifestyle of unfulfilled solitude, and an aversion to interaction with anything outside of the boundaries of the house he lives in, to the extent that by the time of the game's introduction, He's become entirely silent, not speaking to anyone. And that's only the beginning. Reality as the game presents it is designed to appear uncomfortable, unattractive even. A direct break from the ethereal and uniform ambience of headspace. That childlike, simplistic wonder that was so pervasive in the dream dissolves into the morning light, as bitter, sobering glimpses of realism illuminate how complicated and imperfect life can be. It's like those moments where you're snapped out of a story you're invested into, and reminded of things that you may be trying not to think about, not to obsess over. You're presented with a web of characters and relationships in disarray with one another, with raw human dysfunction replacing the innocent faces that the characters wore in their introductions. Implication establishes a distance between Kel and Sunny, as the former reaches out to the latter in a way that suggests that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Even Sunny responding to his invitation, or leaving his house at all, is said to be abnormal. Kel's brother, Hero, who was one of two core anchors for the cast in Headspace, has long since gone to college, focusing on his own life outside of what was once established as a tightly connected group of friends. Basil, the central character that Amori's fantasy adventures revolve around, appears disconnected from Kel and Sunny. He's nervous and reluctant when both approach him, and maintains a blatant feeling of detachment from them. Speaking of their friendship with the subtext of its relegation to the past, now, even by themselves, these are each meaningful in their own ways. The first explores the understated melancholy of growing apart. The second traverses the bittersweet separation from childhood that comes with maturity, and how we each walk our own independent paths. The third dives into the feeling of alienation from those we may have been close to once, as we drift along, battered by our own personal trials. But then, there's Aubrey. Honestly, when looking back on her throughout the opening hours, you wouldn't be mistaken in seeing Aubrey as the character that contributed the most to the vibrancy of the dream world's atmosphere. How could you not, right? I mean, she's presented as a cheerful, affectionate, and empathetic soul, with all the enthusiasm of a girl whose biggest worries are the whereabouts of Basil and her childish banter with Kel. And yet, when you meet her again in the real world, she's the furthest from that caricature that someone could possibly be. Aubrey's reintroduction is a moment that challenges every characteristic we've come to be familiar with. She's antagonistic, dismissive, and entirely closed off, styled visually and behaviorally as some sort of gang member. She and Sunny come face to face, but the potential reunion that might have been there is spoiled by how the encounter comes to pass. Under her watch, Aubrey's new friends terrorize Basil, 
her former friend. And despite the history that ties them all together, when Kel objects to that, her retaliation leads into a fight. And while there's a dozen different things I could say about this moment, there's one thing that stands out from all the rest here. So think about this. When it comes to RPGs, there's a certain expectation when it comes to how they handle encounters. Any way you want to put it, we're used to a general lack of realism when it comes to how much a person can endure in a battle. Whether that's in regards to playable cast members or our opponents, there's no getting around it. Combat itself is exaggerated. Characters flow through it with a level of endurance that defies belief, as blows that would otherwise kill you are shrugged off as a decreasing percentage of an HP meter. But that's an accepted contrivance. You wouldn't expect it to be anything else. And why would you? It's been that way for so long, and become entrenched into the identity of gameplay itself. You go to a game in order to have fun, to step away from the nature of the real world, and do things that wouldn't be possible anywhere else. Any shooter lets you tear through anything, taking hit after hit without faltering. Smash Bros has characters with crushing attacks that don't immediately end matches, and GTA has characters performing crazy stunts that would kill a normal person. Games typically aren't realistic in that particular way, and at first glance, Amori looks to be no different. The game conforms to that convention just as we would expect, but that's in a realm that was established to be a fantasy. Concepts like the ones we see in Sunny's mind can only be just that, an illusion of imagination set against the silhouette of a dream. When you're that accustomed to things that have become commonplace, implication just isn't thought of with the same consideration you'd usually take with other aspects about a game. The character who lives by the rules of a dream is accustomed to that perception just as thoroughly as the player whose experiences with gaming is governed by the conventions of the industry. No one stops to think about what it means to use their weapon throughout dreams and fiction in the context of real life, because that's not the point of either environment. Sonny has spent so long immersed with an absurdity that he can no longer accurately judge the consequences of his actions. And I had been desensitized to the severity of what I was doing through years of convention. So, with nothing more than a single press of a button, I was directed to act just as callous as I do in any other game. And with equal tone, the reality of this one lashed out at me. I expected my attack to maybe connect, do a bit of damage, and for things to go on, as these encounters had been doing for the past few hours. But instead, the battles being cut short? Aubrey's collapsing to the ground? Her friends are panicking? What is going on here? What could possibly warrant- Oh, I was using a knife to attack someone. What was I thinking? What was I doing? That's a weapon. Something that can seriously, even fatally wound someone. And both I and Sunny just used it in a petty fight. It's remarkable how quickly and decisively an experience can completely flip the tone and atmosphere of a moment. Aubrey isn't superhuman. She doesn't have ridiculous endurance or stamina, and neither do you. Fights that take place in this context are just straight up bar brawls between you and whoever you're fighting, and they don't last long either. There's a fight in this setting where you can use pepper spray against your opponent, and it ends the battle instantly, as they take a massive amount of damage. Real weapons tend to do that, even when they're used defensively. The truth of the matter is that this isn't the dream world where the impossible becomes foundational. This is real life. Being wounded has meaning and impact. You can't just replenish an HP bar with pizza or candy. In fact, they don't even heal damage to the body at all. You just 
eat them. You're going to need bandages and first aid kits from the clinic and the shopping center if you want to patch up your injuries. And for me, moments like that were chilling realizations. The game effectively communicated that harsh realism was the only underlying mechanic of this setting. And it's not the final time that expecting a non-realistic outcome led to a shift in my perspective. Not even close. The pure discomfort that this was making me feel stuck with me throughout the rest of that section as a whole. Long after that specific moment had passed, there's a delicate weight given to everything that happens within the context of real life for characters on a personal level, just like it would be for our own world. The reality of someone's mental and emotional state is never as simplistic or filled with delight as imaginative sayings like the dream world would like us to believe. And our own sensibilities aren't ever so easily dealt with either. And the narrative embraces that, uses it to build upon the dreams that we as the player have to unravel to comprehend. There's a moment at the end of the first day spent with Kel where Amori draws your attention to a hint of that concealed psychological complication. Night has long since arrived by the time the two boys finally separate and return to their own homes. After you step through the door, the game offers a brief pause before unleashing this. Enveloped by the pure darkness of the night, Sunny's house appears to manifest as a nightmare for anyone with arachnophobia. As his mind perceives it, every corner draped in shadows is infested with spiders. Whole sections of his home are an insurmountable fortress of horror, and wherever he looks, his surroundings transform into a petrifying home for anything that can be an onslaught to his terrorized mind. That flight of stairs that, this morning, was nothing but a few short steps? It's an eternal experience now. You can feel the darkness closing in, as though it's waiting to drag you into its embrace. Sunny's overactive imagination amplifies everything by orders of magnitude, as though any slight disturbance is a giant spider leg reaching out to strike at you as you ascend that infinite stairwell. He pauses you there every time, overwhelmed, shaking, shivering with fear, until the dread that grips his heart fades enough for you to force him to continue the ordeal, until, finally, something unknown appears to you at the very top of the stairs, and the totality of this nightmare engulfs you. If the confrontation with Aubrey represented a conceptual dissonance between fiction and reality, this is a visceral illustration of pure, unmitigated fear. The surface of happy, sad, and angry emotions that defines the headspace triangle in any encounter is just gone, with one single emotion dominating the entire mechanic in this moment. Afraid. Where the encounters in Headspace were charming and diverse, accompanied by an active and lively soundtrack to accentuate the colorful and unique presentation, this engagement is tense and harrowing, punctuated by a much harsher soundtrack and a leaden appearance. Sunny isn't able to damage this creature. He isn't able to defend against it. It's a figment of his own imagination. And the only way to get through it is to learn how to calm down and look at things rationally. And once Sunny has done that, what was it that he flew into such a panic over? Spiders scuttering across the floor? Along the walls? An infestation that he's never been rid of? It's just a single spider. Something that any of us could easily overcome just by stepping on it. But that's the whole point, isn't it? We can do that, just as easily as we could theoretically do anything else that we're frightened of. But it's those fears that paralyze us, that lock us in place, make things seem bigger than they really are. Just a few moments can feel like an experience that went on for minutes or hours. Any little thing that happens while you're hyper-attentive to something you thought you saw can startle you, make you see something that isn't really there. 
And that influences Sunny just as much as it does us. It's a disproportionate reality for a reaction so severe, but it's also an experience that's easily understood by anyone that shares feelings similar to his own. That's just the way people are. The way reality is. But instead of opening his heart to face the core of his problems, you aren't allowed to see what led to this moment just yet. Sonny prefers to turn away from that reality and descend into his headspace once again, and you as the player are forced to re-enter that enchanting facade of dreams as well. We're immune to that false world now though, right? It won't have the same effect on us again, and we can focus on figuring out exactly what's going on here. Surely, we've been given knowledge from both contexts of the game, and we know how things really are. So... And, initially? Maybe that's true. Fresh with the memories that defined reality, the illusory nature of Headspace was made all the more apparent to me by the immediate, jarring return of that contrastively innocent tone. I watched that atmosphere be broken down by the truth unveiled throughout the previous section. I saw how the cast really was, and was reminded of what reality was really like. There's no way I'd be taken again by this fantasy. However, as I was reacquainted with the dream world through the eyes of Omori, that feeling began to fade away, driven off by re-immersion into that charming and entertaining world. I was sharing my gameplay with a friend as I experienced this section, and our conversation went from a discussion about not being able to see this context the same way after what we had just seen, to talking about sprout moles, going through the amusing nonsense that was Sweetheart's Castle, and praising the incredible boss team at the end while focusing on avoiding a game over. Keeping your thoughts squarely on something that's in a wholly different context is hard when there's so much being thrown at you to keep your mind occupied. I had questions, but they were so drowned out by everything that was happening in Sunny's dreams that by the final stretch of that section, the whole thing nearly slipped my mind entirely. As much as Sunny had lost himself to Omori, I had lost myself to Headspace. The juxtaposition of reality was almost forgotten, and I found myself embracing the magical perspective that had been shattered by sobering reality. You know those times when you're drowning in stress, and you need something to take your mind off of it? Or when you're involved in a serious situation, and you long for everything to go back to the way it used to be? To a time where things seemed so much more straightforward? Less profound? That's this! When I realized that, I began to understand why what I had seen of Sunny's mentality was the way it was. Why he lives within white space, as though fantasy were reality, and the world outside was only a suggestion. Why he foregoes every responsibility we're supposed to have, every ounce of personal growth and experience that we go through, rather than serving as a temporary construct, as a retreat from the uncomfortable and often emotionally oppressive responsibilities of life, this realm of dreams is familiar, comforting. Headspace is a setting that Sunny has come to know as his home, more genuine and palatable to him than the world of reality itself. Everything is frozen in time here, a facsimile of the things that Sunny idealizes and how his life used to feel. Hence, the phrase, Welcome to White Space. You've been living here for as long as you can remember. That's the crux of how Amori constructs its narrative, and that's what makes the contrast of escapist to realist contexts such an effective instrument in guiding us to a more intimate understanding of what the developers are attempting to convey. Something caused Aubrey to go from that cheery girl in his dreams to the person we see in reality. Something caused Hiro to withdraw into himself and then move on to university. Something caused the distance felt with Kel, the dissociation and shift in attitudes seen in Basil. And something created what Headspace is now, who Sunny is now. But that something is contextualized through the interaction between dreams and the waking world. 
Everything in one setting plays off of its opposing point beautifully as emotional realities emerge. And those realities are only so potent because their stage is set by a spotlight of complementary implication. This and this may appear to be polar opposites, and in many ways, they are. But the contrast that's shown to exist between them is, paradoxically, exactly what ties them so inexorably together. And it's how I came to relate so closely to the emotions that Sonny himself feels. It's often said that the narratives that resonate the closest to our hearts are the ones that speak to us when their subject matter is most relevant to the circumstances we face, whether that be bygone or yet appropriate. When we have an intimate familiarity with the context, a connection is formed between us and the narrative we focus our attention on. In this case, that'd be especially true. I wasn't told how Sunny felt. There was no external point of view to directly inform the audience. He's mute throughout the entire course of the game, and no one else knows what's going on inside his head. But I still feel like I have an appreciation for the human being that is Sunny, to a degree that I wouldn't have had otherwise, because I saw and came to know his mentality myself. We all have our own reasons for attempting to escape the fatigue we all occasionally feel, and as anyone who's played this game to completion can tell you, he's no different. The warm captivation of headspace, along with the cold truth of real life, come together to unveil that in such a special way that anyone exposed to it can understand it, almost as their own, the thoughts of another soul experienced vicariously through the reconciliation of vantage points that were once worlds apart. 